Hello, and um, we have a very special episode today. We're here with a very special guest. Yes, Michael Raper. He's a wasp. <laughs> so he's a... He's a records officer at Kew. Um, at Kew Gardens, which is the um, national records office here in the UK. Yeah, not, not Kew Gardens. Uh, not Kew Gardens, but similar area London. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it should be an interesting interview. So what did your job at, as a records office officer entail? Um, what did you have to do well, daily? The, shall I? The National Archives, in my day, it was called the Public Record Office, but it's now called the National Archives, is the place where they transfer records from the government when they become about 25 to 30 years old, perhaps a bit less than, perhaps 20 years old now, um, so that they can be consulted by historians or others who need to have access to the information they contain. So the problem, the, the, the work of the National Archives involves, first of all, selecting the material that is worth preserving permanently, um, that on its value as enduring evidence for historical or other purposes, then transferring it, cataloguing it, which involves listing it and if necessarily indexing it, and in present day, putting the appropriate information onto the computer, onto the computer information database that they keep, then preserving it, which includes storing it in proper conditions, doing any conservation work, repair work that is necessary, and then making it available to public for inspection um, in the public search rooms or online or through copies in other ways of that. Um, that and during my career, I worked in virtually all aspects of that work. And at the very end, I was in charge of the whole situation. The whole so I wasn't doing much. I was just making sure that other people other did people it. Did. <laughs> other, other people. Just making sure other people did their jobs, right? Yeah. I mean, it must, it must be quite um, difficult, especially with some of the really old, like, things from the ten. Yeah, because you, you, you say that you select the things that you think are worth preserving. So you make that, well, people make that decision and then they have to kind of find a way to not to preserve it. Do you have any ways of making sure the paper doesn't peel off? I, I don't, I'm thinking of physical records. Physical records can produce a problem, especially older material. No, very old material, which is on parchment, is preserves very well. Yeah as long as it doesn't get wet. Yeah. Uh, paper, especially some modern paper, is not very good for preservation and it does tend to, if it gets a bit damp, the, the acidity in the paper tends to corrode, corrupt the paper and it turns brown. You've probably seen old bits of paper, that, yeah. Yeah. especially old newspapers. Yeah. Um, right. And in that case, then there are, various ways that you can you can deacidify it but it's um, not very easy for bulk material you can um, let's think what would the other well the main thing is copy it I suppose <laughs> microfilm in the old days and other means of uh, copying now using um, computer scanners and things um, and then just try to preserve it, stop it getting worse. Um, uh, what, about, like, what about like the leather bindings on books? Because I... Leather bindings are a real problem. If you walk into some of the storage areas and brush against the leather bound volumes, you come off with a brown stain on your <laughs> clothes. Uh, and again, there are ways of consolidating the bindings 
uh, but with the quantity of material that is held there, it would only be done for really important material that was in great demand. Um, Being an archivist is not a clean job. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, it's it's interesting because when you say in demand, it's like, so the public wants to see these things. What's relevant to people uh, in today? So it's still a very relevant kind of topic. Well, the, the, most imp- the records that are in most demand, but rarely now have to be consulted in the original because they're available in copies and online, are the census records, right. which are in great demand by family historians, yeah. genealogists. Yeah. And they um, have always been the main, well, not always, but in recent years, for the last 30, 50 years probably, been the main users of the public records, people searching family history, or doing things like local history. I've used the census returns for Roxwell in 1901 in my work that I've done after retirement, after moving here uh, as, a, as a user not as an archivist. Um, So they're the most popular. Um, Then you've got a lot of academic historians who are interested in how the government works and how it dealt with different issues or different crises, um, foreign policy, um, and a lot of interest in the records of the two world wars, World War I. World War Two, yeah. and I suppose to some extent since my time, when, since they've become available, of the Korean campaign and other yeah. other wars that have been fought. Yeah, that's really interesting. It's all about the and also the stuff you you get history as it's told at the time as well because you know how they want to remember things like they will put lots and lots of things in the war effort yeah. and you'll get a certain kind of report right like we're doing great or yeah. the, with the Spanish flu is not a big problem you know yeah, these kind of things so you see I, uh, I, yeah yeah no no go ahead well we have a kind of view i think often with um i see you know the television programs in the bbc they come um the historian will come in and they'll have like a um great big leather bound book and they have their gloves and they'll open it and they'll have this massive bookshelf behind them how much yeah. of that is actually like set the scene how much of that is there and how much of it's not so um well, if, if you're coming to consult the original records, that could be it, not so much with the bookshelves behind because there, there are so many seats in the reading room that the bookshelves are, are separate, yeah. usually, with, with the reference yeah. works on the books. Um, uh, but certainly, if you wanted to come into the National Archives, and I suppose it's the same in a way from what I've seen at Essex Record Office. Yeah, and I'm what not. you want to see is a bound volume. You will see it and there will be a special sort uh, stand to rest it on yeah. and ways to keep the, fl- the, way the yeah. pages open. Um, and um, some of the older material is in scroll form, rolled up. In, in rolls, and that you've just got to unroll it, and it's, uh, you need a, a large surface for that. I, I've seen that kind of thing in museums and things. Yeah, they probably get it from you. Got when they've got like proper scrolls. But I suppose COVID almost been a good thing. People weren't lost, you know, oh. safer for <laughs> gloves and masks. I think um, as you had, as I had in the, there was this one about a philosopher's stone. There's massive, massive scrolls, and it's just keeps going on and they had it on like a turning um, yeah. machine so it kind of yeah. just kept going round and round and it was very interesting. Did you have a question? Um, yes, but like, what, what would, what do you, what the oldest document you, or item you, um, you, you've interacted with? Interacted you? with. The, the oldest, well, there are some slightly older documents but they're mainly casual, not, not really part of the archive. I mean, they're kept in the archives. But the the oldest document in the National Archive that is has been created and preserved by the nation or by the government ever since it was created is Doomsday Book, which was compiled in 1086 on the orders of William the Conqueror and lists 
all the manors, well, most of the manors in England, at least south of the uh, south of the Tees and the the Loon in in, in Lancashire, uh, and gives the details of who owned it, who had owned it in Anglo-Saxon times before 1066, uh, how much it was worth, uh, how many uh, men there were on it in the sense of villains, yeah. bordars and serfs, uh, how many, how many, in some a areas, especially for the east of England, including Essex, it lists the number of um, cattle, the number of sheep, yeah. the number of pigs, right. and sometimes other things like the number of beehives. Yeah. Very, very odd things like things that give gave a value to the to yeah. the manor. I mean, it's, it's, it's like old old money. What's what's worth the world? Yeah. It's like you know, because that with the money of the day, like produce, like beehives. Yeah. Well, I mean, I never heard of beehives, but in the history of writing, I remember looking into these things, and what they always have is that writing comes in as a kind of way to make sure that you've recorded your debts and your payments. So I think there's sometimes um, a romance of you that can be dispelled sometimes in the National Archives, maybe, that um, when they go to the oldest like kind of texts and things, they always they, they tend to find things like accounts and yeah. slightly, more, <laughs> slightly more prosaic things. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Probably, probably the next oldest records in the National Archives are things called pipe rolls, which are the exchequer's accounts, which go back to ooh, 11, 11, Henry the First, uh, which is the beginning of the twelfth century, and there are gaps in them, but they then continue right through for a long time. So you're right. Money was the main preoccupation and the, the main thing they needed to keep records of. Yeah, interesting. And not yeah. very literate times, so you get yeah. more records as you go along. What were you saying? Yeah, you know, I mean, but like, you know, it's like you can almost see the country change through all the records. Like, oh, yeah. They, it's a gradual thing. Um, so, is it, so how did you begin on the records office and, and what was your, how do you enter it? Yeah, how did you, well, I've got to really go back to, I suppose, when I was about seven. It was during the war, and my father was stationed at a place called Catterick. And one weekend, my mother and my sister and I went to spend the weekend with him, and he was allowed leave in a bed, bed and breakfast in a uh, Yorkshire town called Richmond, which has a castle. And I was taken round... Richmond Castle, and I think that was the beginning of history for me. And then later on at school, uh, I had very good history teachers, and one of them, Mrs. Newton, took us all to see Laurence Olivier in Henry V, which is was is really English literature in a way, but. She was our history teacher and thought it would interest us, a load of boys, I was at an boy, all-boys school, um, in history, and it certainly was another thing. So I became interested in history. I had a very good, another later history teacher, who, Mr Mackley, who then really sort of developed my liking for history. And so I knew that I wanted to do something involving history in further education. So I went to Manchester University and got a degree in history, medieval and modern history, and then stayed on to do research for a master's and then some subsequent research before a vacancy occurred for a historian with appropriate background at the National Archives, the Public Record Office, applied, got the job, and found that being an archivist was one of the best ways of using my history de degree yeah. and my historical knowledge, uh, and I, I stayed there for the rest of my career. Um, should, I should say that, if the, um, like all institutions, the National Archives have various ways of entry. 
But for the top level, you usually have to be a graduate and often yeah. with either a, a, a further degree or if you're going to be an archivist, especially in local government, uh, uh, a master's or a diploma in archives from one of the postgraduate university courses. I didn't do the postgraduate archive because I had got a, a, a master's in history. I didn't need that. But now you would probably have to do three years for a first degree, uh, not necessarily in history, but history is probably the best one, most popular one, and then a one-year postgraduate. Uh, and then you can go in at the archivist level. Yeah. But, of course, in the National Archives, we had a staff in my time of over 500 people, of which only about 30 were at that level. And there were people taken it, and probably now even more so, people who had degrees but had not done research or particularly had done the, the, the um, archive training, came in as subject specialists. Yeah. Um, so there were, that was a sort of slightly lower level. And some people came in simply after doing um, at 18 through the normal civil service entry and provided some of the support staff for the people. And then by working, gradually built up their own knowledge and sometimes were able to get promoted within the office into the, yeah. the, the higher levels. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but the normal way was, is, would be to... But the, the, and on top of that, then there were all sorts of specialists. We had conservators who were do, do repairing documents, who were re recruited for the, either having done a conservation degree or because they had great manual skills. We had people who were doing photocopying of various sorts. And then we had masses of people who were just fetchers and carriers, you, the whole, you know. Um, producing ooh, perhaps a thousand documents to and from storage in a day wow. required a lot of, well, not a lot of muscle, but a certain amount of muscle. Sounds but, like a well-oiled machine. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting, that. Yeah. yeah. So it's not, it's not, it wasn't so, there weren't so many then. I, it's interesting. You know, it seemed like kind of a, like a, a skilled, like, not many that you but quite qualified you mean. Yeah, you have yeah. it takes a lot to make it. And um you know. But what's 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 so actually what what do you think would be your most interesting moments or time in the records office when you had to deal with the most interesting requests or sometime like that or the most interesting artifact. Old, old documents, artifacts, things well, like that. Well the 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 the, the person the, the time when there was most public interest was at the beginning of the year, and now because it's done half yearly in the middle of the year, when a new tranche of records come into the office and are made available for public, public inspection for the first time. So if you look at the newspapers round about the 1st of January or the beginning of July, certainly the quality papers, the Guardian, the Telegraph, the, um, the Times and the Independent, perhaps not so much the uh, tabloids, will usually run a few stories about what was happening 25 or 20 years ago that is now they can reveal a bit more than was known at the time from the records. So, so that, that's, that's when there's most public interest. Some, some like special documents would get like pushed back even further. So some some things with the particular interest, or some things that are more private than others. You know, were there any any things that were more likely to be held on for longer? The the, the uh, well the, the position may have changed slightly because of the Freedom of Information Acts, but when I was there. We were governed by an act which permitted the Lord Chancellor at the request of a minister to delay the transfer of um, various 
classes of records or to close them for longer periods than the then 30 years. Um, these were mainly things like the records of the Secret Service. Uh, they are transferred, they are acknowledged and do get transferred, but much later usually, or with much more withheld by the department and only certain things re released. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's, yeah, it's usually nas national security and to some extent personal sensitivity. If there are medical records right, of people, they, they require them usually to be sure that they, the person they refer to would be dead by putting usually, say, a 75-year closure clear period on yeah. things of that sort. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Is it? Because, you yeah. know, you've got to walk that fine line between showing everyone and... Keeping. keeping what's important yeah. i yeah. think um with these records offices it's it's very important because you have you then have your um things can get lost quite easily i think that sometimes people actually do find things like themselves which they might submit yeah. to you so do people usually submit from private kind of because I, I i imagine sometimes when people are clearing out the homes of a dead relative they'll, they'll find these uh, kind of scraps of history well, by and large the national archives doesn't take private records of that sort but if a retired or the descendants of a retired person who'd been a minister of government and had official papers that have been taken home they might well accept them as a, as a, a deposit um, normally if you find things uh, that are not of, of, nas of national importance, not of national importance, the, low, the appropriate repository would be the county record office. Right, right. That would be evidence, right? Right, say, uh, say when, once we die, our adopted, right? Right. Yeah. 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 Ye
that's where, if there's a flood, at least some of the water will go down into yeah. those pools at the much lower level rather than flood the, uh, yeah, no, the right. its place itself. So, so everywhere has its problems, I suppose. But in in Johnson, we Essex, we know about floods. Do we? It's yeah. Not not so. But yeah, I mean, I suppose you'd have a kind of problem everywhere, any, anywhere you went. Yeah, I mean, it just. But like, I think in Kew, it's like kind of so paramount because they these are the. The most record. Q is the. The record. Top level. Yeah, I and it. It's what, what would you say to people who are starting out who thinking of going towards Q? Um, would you give them any advice or tell them anything to do with the job, what they should do? You mean, you, sorry, you mean to, to going to as it were to work there? Yeah. Yeah. Well, as I've said, of the, the best way um, to get into certainly one of the uh, the better jobs, if I might say so, or the higher up the ladder job, would be to get a good go get good school result, school college results, go to university, uh, probably do a history degree or, or not necessarily. But now the, the way the degrees are, something that involves some historical perspective in it. Uh, it could be something like you know international studies or the, the degree but yeah. where where it involves a measure of history and then get a good degree and apply to go on one of the university archive courses or if you are really good stay on at university and get a master's or even a doctorate and then go in as a subject specialist but otherwise, or go in as do the archive course and go in as a general archivist. That's fine. That, but um, I would think if you wanted to go in in any other way, it would be a matter. Well, even getting a vacancy at the higher level could be a matter of luck because there aren't so many posts and there are not so many vacancies at any one time. But. Uh, Going in at a lower level and working your way up is a possibility, but you would have to be very lu lucky to say that there was a vacancy through the normal civil service type of ex local examinations. Uh, so they're a sort of civil servants in a way. They're kind of, because it is connected to government. Yes, the keepers, of, the keepers and all the staff of the public record office are civil servants. Um, and... Uh, so they're part of the government machinery and in theory could be transferred to any other government department um, and indeed sometimes have have people do get transferred in and out um, especially we've used people from recruited people from other departments to do the business of the selection of records because they're familiar with the de with say a government department say the foreign office and how it works and what was important so they're useful to be involved with uh, that sort of side of the work so because they, because, they, because they will have got it from the other side say like the foreign office or the yeah. uh, department of health they'll know what Going, what, what was going, going, on. going on with, say, health records or defence, or you know, they'll know what's of public interest. And they, yeah. they, 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 yeah. Yeah. Each department has to appoint a departmental record officer who is responsible. Well, it might not be called that now because there's probably something like the departmental information officer because it will include computer records as well but in my time of course it was mainly proper not proper records paper records uh physical records shall i say there was a departmental record officer in each department and he's the person that the national archives liaise with over how the government that department preserves those records which ought to be preserved and selects those which ought to be transferred to the PRO, to the National Archive. Sorry, I still can't for, for, keep forgetting that. Um, and they have their departmental staff who 
sometimes are subject specialists, but sometimes are just general civil servants, but who get bitten by the bug. And sometimes some of them get transferred and work in the public record and the national archives later on in their careers. Yeah. A kind of, kind of interchange between the departments. So, um, do you, they, are they kind of um, any difficulties, stresses to the job? What would you, yeah. how would yeah, you face yeah. that? What, 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 what is the, was it quite stressful? Like Or difficult, with, the, with all these important kind of information? Was, was there ever, like, the fear of someone, something happening? Or, you know, someone holding to account something? <sighs> I don't think I ever felt it was ever overstressed. There were times when um, there were, there were perhaps extra respon extra pressures. And in my case, that was when they opened the new record office at Kew because the person who was supposed to be responsible of, of it wasn't um, under the uh, top people for commissioning the new building and seeing for the transfer of records, staff and everything and equipment there, retired, resigned from the office in February. We were due to start moving in June, July and I was given the job. So I, I had a summer of 1977, which was when we moved into Kew, when I didn't have any leave at all, quite often worked on Saturdays, half days, or even full days, while we were getting things sorted, getting all records time. moved, and making sure everything was all, all right at the other end. Yeah, that's interesting. So you see, it does take a lot of... Um a lot, a lot of coordination, I mean. Yeah. But it isn't a thought that I just had a while ago. You know, video, like, did you ever have, would old news footage become part of the records? Like physical film, like on reels? Was that uh, ever part of um, Movies or cine films yeah. are... They're a very tricky thing. The, the National Archives itself doesn't handle them, but the National, it, the National Film Archives handles them on behalf of the National Archives. And it's a bit the same with um, um, electronic records that the, the, the National Archives at present doesn't handle electronic records but the national i think it's the british library has a uh, an electronic sort of di di document yeah. facility and handles some of them for, on on their behalf um, not all public records go to the national archives um, a lot that are created locally go to local record offices and some specialist records that the National Archives doesn't have the equipment or the expertise to deal with it are similarly deposited with places where that expertise is. Like yeah. So there, there are all sorts of creative ways also how they, stu the, they store things. So I've been to the, um, had the luck and the opportunity to go to the um, British Library you mentioned and they had this... Um, Wonderful sort of area because I, you know, students like to go there. People who study these kind of things, yeah. like history yeah. and stuff, it's very interesting because they had these kind of um, they had ev everything from you know stat because the uh, records office I understand they would probably have like the national archives rather would probably have like a, um, a books and 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 text. But what they had was like you know um, sheets that you could pull out the walls and they had stamps on them and they would have like pictures you know they, they were just kind of you can just pull it out and they were to have like scrolls and rolling parts and things so there is a kind of uh interplay i suppose with the yeah. between the archives the libraries and the yeah. so it's like it's a sort of long-term library that you yeah. can kind of store it's like that you can bring things out the from. nation's library you know? i suppose yeah, we, we parallel very much what's in the british library in their department of manuscripts a lot of, especially before the 20th century, a lot of 
government records at the highest level by ministers simply were taken by the ministers when they retired. So a lot of the prime minister's records of the 19th century and earlier are not in the National Archives. They're often um, in, in, a lot are in the British Library, but others are, are in very strange places. I know in America they do this weird thing where each president has their own library and, yeah. and they have to curate all their own documents. Like they've got like it's George, you know, George Bush and Oh, they all have their own, their, they're called presidential libraries. Oh. But they have to maintain their own records office by law about themselves. Oh, so that's quite embarrassing, really. I mean, the stuff that you accidentally tweeted about, you know, <laughs> a leakage in government you have to record yourself and, and preserve. It's, I think it's, 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 a, it's but, a much better system to have them all in but, um, a few so locations. Would some of the early prime ministers just take their stuff home, as it were? Yeah. Yes. Um, I think the last person to do it was Anthony Eden, and his records finished up in, I think, Birmingham City Library. Winston oh. Churchill did it, and his records are in Churchill College. Um, but despite that, there are a lot of records of the Prime Minister's office from the wartime when Churchill was Prime Minister um, and, and a lot of earlier um, Lord Palmerston's papers are in Southampton University um, and th th they're all sc scattered a bit around the country, but a lot are in the British Library for the earlier ones. What the official view of what should be done now is for, for all ministers, including the Prime Minister, is the people concerned with holding their records should keep three sets, so not three sets, but three sort of lines of records, if you were. Anything that relates to national government is public records. But what are not public records are anything that relate to party political matters or well, because if they're MPs to their constituency, yeah. they are not public records. But anything they do as a minister of the crown is, 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 should be public records and should be kept separate from the other material and go through the normal processes of preservation and selection and transfer. And, and that usually works fairly well now important to keep the biases out and keep them all an interesting point is um do you have do the royals submit their records <laughs> <laughs> no we do not have i mean there are obviously a lot of things relating to the royal family and often they're embargoed for a hundred years if they're private personal uh, but the, the Royal Archives is maintained as a separate institution and it's, in, uh, it's kept in the Round Tower at uh, Windsor Castle. Oh, so and they're it, in charge of their own records. Yes, yes. All right. So everyone seems to, it seems to be, um, it's actually quite um, different from what I thought. They're very, they are spread about. But um, I suppose you, you keep like, a, you say that, Oh, if you want to find that, yeah, may have a directory or something. Say, go to Essex, then go to Royal Library. One of the parts of what is now a part of the National Archives, but in my time was a separate organisation, the Historic Manuscripts Commission ran something called, and still runs, the National uh, Register of Archives. And that is um, I, online and probably on the National Archive website now, I don't know, um, I'm afraid. Uh, and through that, if you, you can in, sort of uh, interrogate the website, and if you've got, say, you're interested in Joe, Sh Joe Smith, who was Prime Minister in what's it, yeah. it will pull up all the records that relate to him, wherever they are, and direct you to the appropriate national institution 
or local record office or museum or library or wherever it, they happen to be preserved. Yeah, yeah. So it just directs you to the appropriate place. And I suppose these kind of um, skills like indexing and, and things like that is very important. Research skills, kind of how to find things out, how to, you know... How to dig deep, you know, yeah. wade, yeah. wade through hours of... And I suppose journalists can go in there as well. They, yeah. If, if they want to do like a story or the something. Gen yeah, the journalists often go to the queue. Is there? Is there doing a story? One of one of my jobs at one time in my career there was, among other things, it wasn't a full time job, was being press officer, and there were very frequent requests from the press for information, or. Um, guidance of how to find the information. Uh, some of the best pressmen knew their way around the records as good well as the staff and often were able to find things that the staff didn't even know were there. <laughs> but, uh, or, or to draw even with one very clever man who would noti notice where the gaps were in the lists and then assume what was probably being withheld by the government, by the department, because it, of where it would have come in the lists. Quite clever, yeah. I mean, um, you've talked about your your history teachers, how they how they influence you, and how you know education shapes the your view. Uh, do you think there are ways that young people can get sort of or People increasingly, anyone can get interested in these kind of archives. You, you've said they, there's genealogies and stuff, but would they? You would you recommend anything, any way of them getting into the subject? I suppose. Yeah. I don't know about the way in which Essex Record Office works at present, but certainly in the past, a lot of the local record offices did educational packs. packs which enabled school teachers to use the facsimiles of records in teaching history so that it wasn't just sort of what they spoke, but they could actually show, say, what an entry in a, a, a will or an entry in a, a, a birth a record or something of that sort or, or, or a letter from somebody of importance was, uh, with the information in. Um, I don't know whether they still do it, but they're, um, uh, you know, not a lot of them did in the past. Uh, they probably do. I would imagine Essex Record Office, when it's fully functioning and not we're not in COVID, yeah. probably does some sort of liaison work with local schools and colleges um, on uh, uh, the sources that are there and how to use them and run special... I, I know in the past they've run special courses. I mean, I, I was on a project that I did a few summers ago where me and a few other people were making a film, so we had to go and research stuff in... Um, Essex Records office, and they, they were very good. They are very friendly towards, like, you say what you're looking for and they're pointing you in the right direction, you know. That That's good. Yeah. They, I think the word is user-friendly, you know. They're not, you know, um, records offices, they're quite... You know. Important for every group, right? There's, there are, of course, other civil servants maybe recognised. I don't know. Um, when I for for me, I don't think I was very um, aware of the records of this um, because I don't I don't think most people are very aware because it's a kind of we we have lots of people who are supposed to be kind of um, important in the community, but we don't often have a look at who's keeping track of what's going on since. Like you know, ten eighty six. He's he's been who has been watching over, but it is it's an important job, and I I feel it, you know. I'm glad you brought you bored the uh the job for a while, and it's like I'm glad I know about it now. I think I only learned about it a few months ago. Yeah, a few months ago. I mean, and I mean, we like these are things that, and I like how it's open to anyone. Yeah, it's I mean, not. It's one of those public services, like the like the um, 
well, I suppose the other pubs are like the BBC and things like that. The BBC, yeah. you, you can you can just go back and you can find out things, not just about your ancestors, things like that, but the your local area, your yeah, or like that project that me and you might might yes. do one day. Well, maybe, maybe we were thinking of maybe going down to one of the records offices and local records office that is, and you know, not where you worked, but try and find out some things about about a, a, a influential figures around here. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's a useful service, I'm it's glad. Useful service, and I, I just, I'm, I hope it conti- you know, continues you, into the digital age, but I mean, it's going to be hard. It's it's a weird thing, I wonder how. Because like, if they people like Donald Trump, a lot <laughs> of his stuff was by tweets. Now, how do you... How do you how do you how, keep how do track they, of them? How do how are they gonna how are they gonna do this? I mean I I, I don't know. Sorry, I don't know either. <laughs> I'm, I, 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 I must, I'm glad I retired what, <laughs> nearly 30 years ago and don't have to worry about Donald Trump's <laughs> tweets or Boris Johnson's tweets or anything of that sort. I mean, in my time, it was all paper records. We were the worst computer material and we, be, we were concerned about how we were going to con, uh, keep it. But it wasn't um, like the material now, which is floating around in the media on machines like that. Yeah. And uh, uh, controlling it is a real problem. I mean, there's hardly a week goes by is there, when, when somebody's found some government records yeah. behind a bus shelter yeah. or, or found a, a laptop on a train or yeah, no, something yeah, of that sort. Yeah. Leaks and uh, and uh, tweets, right? I think yeah. the but the it's just like now there's a kind of there's records so office in the sky almost. It's like the you have your um or in the cloud you have you can store your um your social media. Everyone has a kind of and some people now it's it's becoming it's it's only a beginning to happen now. People who have got onto social media have died and now they're still there in a way. There's like, you, you can see the history of their thoughts, or as you can see the history of now, I mean, I suppose in, in, a, in the, you know, um, 12th century, 13th century, not many people could write. No one really had notebooks like they did yeah. in ancient China. They couldn't just open a notebook and write down. And now there's just like a private archival office. Yes, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> the, the, the problem, Oh, it was bad enough when it was on paper, <laughs> but well, now it's all in electronic form. How you, first of all, identify the material, get hold of it, um, given that some of it is probably pass, passport, uh, password <laughs> protected, and how when you've got all, hold of it, you sort out what it is and what is important and then when you've done that, how you preserve it, I, I'm afraid I have no answer to that at all. I know that the professional literature now of the uh, archivists is almost entirely taken up by how do you identify and preserve the important um, records that only exist in uh, the forms of, you know, digital or even other... Uh, analog or other other forms that are uh, are non physical. Yes. Yeah, it and it then, does seem like the floodgates are open, doesn't it? Yeah, so many things are changing, but I think I think the records office will still be important. I think it's still be relevant because it will you, you adapt, can have you, you, I think. yeah. I mean, because you 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 can ha- you're gonna have th- those documents as you say, right? The old documents will remain, like the things from sixteenth century things. They still exist. They still exist. So it's it's a it's a problem with the new stuff. But a lot of the new stuff, the more you write, inevitably, the less is like the most important thing. They used to just write the the absolute necessities. Now we now we write. Hello, everything. Well, <laughs> I went to the shop. The, the yeah. further you go in the history, the more the less people write seem to write important stuff. Yeah, I'm telling you, go back to the beginning, and it was just like accounts of kings and things. But yeah, it's um, and it would be interesting to see how 
records themselves that the whole format of 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 governments change maybe and records. emails and some people have forgotten how to use emails already i, I think how how they've it feels like they just they, things just turn up and, and disappears <laughs> Emails are about as far as I have got with modern technology. I don't. I have them. I have them. No, I haven't brought it with me. But I have them. I don't, so I don't carry it all the time. A mobile phone, and I only use it as an emergency telephone when I'm out of the house, um, and uh, as a sort of backup. But uh, um, I mean, when I left. When I retired from the public record office, there were no computers as such in there, apart from the main computer which controlled the document requisitioning system, which we'd introduced in 1977 and modernised. But apart from, some of the secretaries had um, smart typewriters, which had a memory with them, but only a small memory and short-term memory, so that you didn't, if you drafted some, dictated something, the secretaries could type it up, give you the draft, and they, you could say, well, I want to change this or that, or you've misspelled that or whatever. And then they, would, they could do the correction before printing out. But none of this, I had to learn how to use a PC when I, I, I retired and needed to do, to do some uh, access to information and learn how to use the internet. I mean, I'm not, I'm not even... Well, yeah, thirty years. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm not even up to that. I don't bring my phone. I didn't. I did bring my phone here. I usually forget, and someone has to call me, and then we have to use the the landlines. I think in America they've made that a lot of people have left behind the actual home phone, which is worth writing. It's like yeah. I've, I've, I don't know how social media works or or how no, to no. do phones or or something. I think it's a bit more no, up to date. No, no. But this is about as technical as we get. You yeah, know? Uh, but I think we'll all be left behind. This, I suppose. But I know. I I feel I feel like. You know, like there are some twelve-year-olds that know more about it. Yeah, well, we 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 yeah, we're all a bit out of date. But you know, it's it's been really interesting to have a chat and it's really been great to find out all learn the about stuff like, of history. And it, it, because we are kind of re really big into history. You know? Yeah, we we, it was it's really really interesting. The actual the actual job of preserving everything and yeah, it keeps great. It's and it's, it's and it's <laughs> yes and it's necessary. And it's you that know. part of the state apparatus. Anyway, um, so we'll, we'll, I think we'll end it. Here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for coming on the show. And, um, uh, uh, so thank you very much for listening and uh, asking such interesting questions. Thank you. Um, Thanks, you've had a lot to tell us. All right. And um, as always, um, I, hope you've, I hope you at home have enjoyed the show. <laughs> if, you, if you ever encounter it. Yeah, um, bye. That's bye.